So let's begin with session one. Uh, which we've entitled Arise and Scanning, a scene-setting piece on the future context for the provision of essential services. And I hope that some of the developments that we might consider in this session are things like the ageing population, uh, growing health issues, uh, environmental challenges, reduced welfare benefits, the continued austerity programme, the impact of Brexit, and of course the changing nature of vulnerability. So to give us some initial thoughts uh, on this uh, Arise and Scanning, I'd like to introduce uh, Sharon Darcy, who is Director of Sustainability First. Uh, Sharon and I served on the board of Consumer Focus together, and I know that she's passionate about uh, co the consumer interest, especially, uh, or most especially, in the water and energy sectors. And as you all hear, she always takes a, a longer and broader view uh, than many uh, other uh, observers. So please welcome Sharon Darcy. Thank you very much, Roger, um, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Sustainability First is a really small environmental charitable think tank um, and we focus on getting the best in terms of practical solutions for environmental and social well-being. Um, before I start talking about our work and then about the issues that Roger's asked me to touch on this morning, I'd just like to maybe take a slightly different uh, take on the title I've been given. What should I put in the jam jar fund uh, for my rainy day fund if I live to be 100 and if I don't know when the next severe weather event is going to happen and if I don't know what the state is going to provide as I get sick um, and in my old age. So that's a slightly different take um, on the context issue. So a little bit more about sustainability first. We're a think tank. Um, I'd just like to touch on two of our projects uh, which are relevant to our work, the discussion here today. The first is our project Inspire, which is about innovation for energy customers in vulnerable circumstances. Um, and this was done by my colleague Zoe McLeod, who's speaking later with a different hat on. It's full of great case studies of what you can do to innovate for people in vulnerable circumstances. And the second is our new energy and water public interest network project which I talked about last time I was here. And that's really tried to identify what the public interest is for this longer term perspective in the energy and water sectors. And this has identified some public interest outcomes around quality of service, value for money, clean services, resilient services, uh, services which recognize place-based well-being and fair services. So that's a little bit of context about the work that we do both of these reports are on our website, so please do take a look. So when we look to the future and we think about the uh, changing context for vulnerable uh, customers and for the users of essential services, what should we really bear in mind? Well, I think the first thing that everybody in this room would recognise is that the context in which these services are being delivered is changing very, very quickly. The pace of change is exponential. Things that we thought were only going to happen sort of in the next five years have already happened. The future is fast upon us. And that's leading to real challenges uh, for established uh, procedures and social protections. Consumer safeguards are struggling to keep up. And that's partly because, as we all know, these services are starting to converge and blur together. So silo-led decision-making finds it quite difficult to respond when you're getting packaged services. But the consumer interest and the user interest in these services is also starting to blur with the citizen interest. And that's leading to real challenges to institutions who are based on a silo-based sector-by-sector model. Additionally, it's leading to political challenges political challenges for organisations who often seem remote and clunky and unresponsive to users. And the definitions of what essential services are are also changing. Now, broadband access is a case in point, and I'm sure most of us would recognise that that's now essential if you want to access any other services in life. But I think we need to look deeper than that, because broadband access is dependent on electricity 
machine-to-machine -machine learning that sort of delivers many of the things that we use in our day-to-day -day lives is dependent on electricity. So electricity dependency is actually becoming a fast-growing issue when you think about the future. So the future is a very uncertain place. And when you look at the context and what that means for users of essential services, we really need to think a little bit more about how we develop a coherent view of the future, which puts consumers, citizens, users, whatever you call them, at the centre of those services, rather than the needs of the individual sectors that deliver the services. And as I go through a few headlines here in the vast array of things that Roger's asked me to speak about, I also want to say it's important that we look at both the opportunities here for users of services, but also the risks. So here's some headlines in terms of the opportunities, the positive things that are going to be down the line in the sort of rapidly changing world we live in. Personalisation of services ensuring that these are really sort of um, focused on our needs um, rather than the needs that um, service providers think we might have. The fact that we're all going to live longer and healthier lives. The possibility of developing local and shared approaches. And then the advantages of clean technology. So all these things are opportunities there that we need to really grasp if we're going to ensure that future services are people-centred. But there are also a range of risks. And I'd like to um, really leave this slide up because I think some of these figures are quite important. And I'd like to look at each one in terms of a pest analysis, looking at sort of the political, economic, and social and technological trends that underline some of these things. But turn that on its head because I think the key trend that we need to get to grips with is changes in technology. And rather than just look at economic trends, because I'm from a sustainability think tank, I also want to look at environmental trends. So when we look at um, technology, I think there's four issues here that are relevant when we think about pe how people use services. And the first one that I'd like to point out is the impact that technology is having on our world of work. Now, this will impact the users of services, because it will impact their views about job security and their issues around affordability. We haven't got Silicon Valley in the UK, but we do have a Silicon Roundabout. And we all know that it's, in many ways, never been easier to start up a new business. Easier, quicker, cheaper. But there's problems associated with that. Although lots of people want to work in the gig economy, and it's very attractive in some ways, it can fit around your other caring commitments if you've got them. You can do it remotely. It is leading to insecurity. And the TUC have estimated that already one in 10 people uh, are suffering from more insecure employment <coughs> relationships because of zero hour contracts, short term contracts, etc. And there's also some other issues around this. When we get increased automation, that's going to start impacting on different people in different ways. The in PwC's report, Will Robots Take Our Jobs? They estimate that a third of UK jobs could be at risk of automation by the early 2030s. But for those with GCSE qualifications or lower, this could be as high as 46%. So this is a significant amount of people who use services who are going to see their lives changed dramatically. The second thing I'd like to point out in terms of uh, technology and technological trends is this issue around personalisation. Yes, it's great having services that are based around us, our real needs, our individual personal issues that we face in our lives. But there's a potential downside there as well because that can lead to the unwinding of social cross-subsidies that were put in place to protect particularly more vulnerable people. Of course, new cross-subsidies can also come into play so a, a company might offer me free energy, but at the cost of being tied into a, a long-term sports TV package, for example. And also, many of these technologies rely on algorithms uh, in order to make some of these decisions for us. And it's quite difficult to really regulate algorithms and to understand whether they're competitive or anti-competitive, whether they're really doing what it says on the tin. The third thing I'd like to point out in terms of uh, technology is around the demand side. 
Technology does enable people to have more choice, more control, if they want it. In sectors like energy and water, that's absolutely essential to drive down future costs. But also, that comes at a price. People who are on low incomes, for example, are unlikely to be early adopters of new technologies, so they might not be able to take the benefits of new, smarter futures. So moving on to social issues and the social aspects around um, pest analysis, and this is clearly really important in an ESAN conference. Yes, we are all living longer. That's fantastic. Today, um, Bayes, the Department for Business um, and Energy and Innovation, said that a child born today can expect to live to 100. Well, that's brilliant. But we all know that as we get older, we get more complex health needs, and that puts pressures on individuals, but also their carers, um, and on service providers. <laughs> now, assistive living technologies are a really big potential upside here. But technology, as we know, can be isolating, and it can lead to mental health issues. And loneliness, it's been calculated, can have the same impact on our mental health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So that's quite significant. Social issues, obviously housing is a big issue. We know we've got issues in the housing markets. Prices have gone up and rents are going up. We've got more people living in the private rental sector and that means they haven't got necessarily security in their lives. It makes it more difficult for them to plan. And it can lead to principal agent problems when you are a service provider and you're trying to get behaviour change in a house, for example, with multiple people living together. Moving on to the economy, we all know that the economic forecasts are slightly sluggish and Brexit can exacerbate some of those trends just because of the uncertainty um, it's likely to lead to. And factors which had previously driven down poverty levels are now in question. So state support for people on low incomes is not keeping up in real terms. So inflation is really starting to bite if you're on benefits. We know that rents are increasing, and we know that this rising employment is not necessarily leading to improvements in standards of living. Child poverty is on the increase, across the country and in some areas more particularly, and absolute poverty is increasing in certain regions. This is the 21st century. Debt is go growing, going up, um, and the OECD has said for the UK, this contributes a major financial stability risk. And the debt to income ratio is projected to be 150% by 2023. I don't know if that's sustainable, I guess not. But we're also seeing wealth inequalities. So it's not just income inequality, it's issues around wealth. And those are driven by pensions and housing. Generation rent, who may feel excluded from this, are getting increasingly vocal. And last but not, not, last but not least, but moving on to the important issue of environmental impacts when you look to the future. We all know that with climate change, we're getting more extreme weather. The beast from the east, Storm Emma that we saw last week, it's difficult to see an upside here. You could say communities get closer together and that defeats isolation, um, reduces isolation. But when things move on, some people are left uh, picking up very big tabs and that leads to significant questions around insurance. You can say with climate change, well, we're getting lots of new jobs in the tech sector, the clean tech sector, that's got to be great but they might not be where existing jobs are, so that can lead to social dislocation. And now, last but not least, the political picture. Politics in this country is looking increasingly polarised. We've got pressures on our public services. We're seeing councils who are going bust. We're seeing hospitals that are really creaking at the seams. And that's even before you get to Brexit. So how do you deal with essential service issues when you've got this very, very polarised political debate. Some people are saying you should leave it all to the individual, get rid of the nanny state, let free markets rip and let the disruptors in. They will provide a way to the promised land. Others are saying taxation, progressive taxation, will pool risks, pool costs, that's fairer, that will lead to distributional issues. Well, I think what we do know 
is that unless essential service providers really take to heart and really focus on tackling some of these social and environmental issues that I've outlined, we're unlikely to ensure that the interests of consumers and citizens are really at the heart of decision making. So, how do we move forward in this uncertain time? We do know that users of essential services don't like change. And if you don't deal with these social and environmental issues, if you don't deal uh, with some of the basics, you're unlikely to be able to enable those that do like change, some people do, uh, but people don't like shocks, they like change but they like to feel in control. If you don't get this right, if you don't frame it right as a society, you're going to have ever-increasing erosion of trust in essential services. And that can lead to political risks and political volatility. So how do we stay focused on public interest outcomes, the interests of consumers and citizens as we go forward through these choppy times? Well, I'd like to very briefly just say a few things that strike me as important. We need to build consensus <coughs> on what outcomes are important. We need a cross-sector approach. We don't live in a silo world anymore. We need to be flexible, because we don't know who's going to live to 100 and who's going to um, uh, maybe not. And we need more inclusive approaches and potentially a 21st century universal service obligation. This could be a hypothecated tax. This could be something that is uh, levied on uh, service providers in groups. There's lots of different ways that you could do it. It could be a basic income. I hope we get to talk about that today. Thank you.